Today, my guest is Nina Laug, CEO of Glycan Age, a company that calculates your biological age. In this episode, we delve into the science of age reversal. This internal decline that happens leads to disease. And if you tackle this early, instead of waiting for an issue, then you're actually doing preventive healthcare. How menopause affects biological age. So HRT works really well. We did a nice placebo-controlled trial and we would see about nine years aging in menopause. So your bio biological age on the average changes by nine years. Um, and actually the ones who are the youngest pre-menopause usually have the steepest slope of aging as they go through menopause. What lifestyle changes can help reduce your age? And if they gain weight, they are aging faster. If they are losing weight, they are aging slower. And then we did that in um, like caloric restriction diet as well. Nina, hello and welcome to my show. Um, thank you for agreeing to be a guest here today. No, thank you. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Well, Nina, I wanted to get you on when I heard you talk at the Health Optimization Summit a few weeks ago. Uh, I've always been um, fascinated with age, aging and trying to prevent or stop aging, defying what, um, what we consider old age and, um, and how we sort of reverse the clock. And I guess, although we're not quite there yet, the science has come on so much um, that, that there's, there's the lots that, that can be now, can now be done about it. Um, but before we get into your company, can you tell me a little bit about your background, um, what you do and how you've got to where you've got to today? Sure. No, absolutely. But just to add to your you know, comment on aging, I think aging is, is great. I feel better every year. You know, you have this experience and confidence in life. I, I definitely want to age, uh, but I don't want to age biologically, which is a different thing. And I think that's what you're talking about. Um, so my background is not actually science, it's tech, um, but I come from a family of scientists. So both my um, mother and father are, are scientists. Um, my mother's a neuroscientist and my father's a glycobiologist. So this company actually came from his work. So the, the background of the story on this is, is not actually mine, it's his. Um, but I came into it, actually, um, I guess we came full circle in. But um, when he was 20, uh, my dad, uh, he joined the glycobiology lab, which we'll talk about um, uh, later. And he, will, you know, he met my mother and they worked on a paper together on brain aging. So glycans and brain aging. And this was 1991. Um, and then they had uh, me as, an, as one of the consequences of this. So I guess we came full, full circle into that. Um, so my background is tech. I did tech for almost uh, 12 years, actually. So I started quite um, young uh, with startups. So I had um, about um, uh, five companies, three of which were successful businesses. Um, and then over the last 10 years, because this, um, this field, of aging clocks is, is about 10 years old. So even our aging clock was published about 10 years ago. Um, he was convincing me throughout the time saying, you know, this can be something, you know, this is a, you know, in interesting thing we stumble on in research, we can measure aging of people, like internal aging of people. This can eventually turn into a product. But I think when he was pitching it to me, first time I was, um, I was 20. So you know, I didn't care wow. about age. If anything, I always, you know, I would say, you know, try and hide my age or say the 25. So I was like, I do not want to know. You always want to look older the younger you are. And then when you get older, you want to look young. It's just, yeah, it's one of those things. Yeah, it always works like that. Um, but I think when I started to understand it from a preventative healthcare perspective, so, you know, this internal decline that happens leads to disease. And if you tackle this early instead of waiting for an issue then you're actually doing preventive healthcare. and then you know i i, I got passionate about it and um we started it off um, commercially uh in 2020 after a few decades of research and i was our first investor so that's how i got into it wow so you hung up i guess your um entrepreneurs have well no you're still a, a huge entrepreneur but hung up your own things and um, to concentrate on on the family business 
Yeah, I think as you you mentioned, you know, we we spoke about your background before we got going. I got to a stage where I had a very successful business. I was making more money than ever in life, and I was incredibly bored with what I was doing. I was not fulfilled. It just didn't um, hit the right spots. And with this, I, I make a lot less than I used to, and I don't care about it. Honestly, I say I love the fact that um, I could stop working for money or the money doesn't matter anymore so um and i think that's if you can get to that point and and look especially with the work you're doing now nina um which is which is incredible you're really changing people's lives and um and you know you're, you're a hallmark for the future but let's get into this Let, let's talk about like an age can you t give me a, a little bit of, a, of an overview of like an age and we're going to have to ask the question what glycans actually are. And, and that's the most difficult one because glycans haven't been publicly spoken about a lot or they have not been popularized. Um, genetics have been popularized. Microbiome has been popularized. popularized uh, but the glycobiology has stayed on this kind of fringe science because you don't, don't have many scientists working on it. You have couple hundred scientists in the world working on it while you have you know a hundred thousand um, neuroscientists and, and so forth um, but what glycans are if you look at cell biology so we look at a cell um, it has four components one is dna then protein then lipid or fat and carb and glycans are the carbs or the sugar part but a lot of times when we say sugar people think about dietary sugar they think about how the sugar you're eating impacts your biology or things that lead to diabetes, damage of sugars to your proteins that leads to diabetes. But actually there's a different sugar process, a sugar language uh, that we created. So this is sugars you manufacture within yourself that become a component of uh, your lipids, your proteins, all of your biology that are there to enable your biology to communicate. There will be the, these types of therapies in the future where you can um, uh, manipulate them with a drug or a dietary, but they're not um, sugars that are, you, you, you manufacture them, you create them. They're not sugars that are impacted directly by your diet. Um, so it's more of sugars that have evolved for you to change beyond genetics. And for your, you can think of it, you know, they're this thing that helps everything communicate. So you do, if you think of multicellular life, we would not have multicellular life or complex organisms without cell-to-cell -cell communication and that's what these sugars enable with aging what we specialize or what the lab specialized in originally are antibodies uh, because of this um well the, the whole space uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies became a very popular um, uh, therapy or drug and it was understood exactly what do these sugars on antibodies do but nobody was uh, quantifying them at scale. Nobody was looking at thousands of people to understand at scale what the sugars are doing. Um, so back in 2006, 2007, um, our lab ran a study uh, for the first large analysis of this part of biology. So the first 1,000 human glycans um, were analyzed then with our lab, uh, which is in Croatia, and another lab in Dublin, uh, which pioneered this space to look at this part of biology at scale. And then as this got into a couple hundred thousand people, what they realize is if they're looking at the disease, they can't make sense of it unless they know age of a patient. Uh, because the uh, age of the patient has a stronger impact than the disease. Or you can have a young person who has a chronic condition who has a profile of a healthy old person. And what they were specifically looking at, and, and you, you know, you can look at many different, you know, you can look at glycans on. Um, you know, many different proteins and, and lipids and cells. Um, they were looking at them on um, antibodies or the adaptive immune system, specifically immunoglobulins. And the adaptive immune system is your immune system throughout life. So everything that's impacted it, how it's changed throughout life, um, you know, with impact of your genetics, with impact of your environment, your epigenetics, and your lifestyle. And what they saw is that as the immune system ages, it loses or it changes functionality in a way that it overreacts to the wrong thing, creating chronic inflammation. So what 
we actually see with aging, we see this um, accumulation of chronic inflammation throughout life or something called inflammation uh, that later on turns into disease. But we also look at the other side of it, which is anti-inflammatory, which loses this function with time. Because when we're young, we're really resilient. You react to a threat and you shut down inflammation straight away, but you react as your body should. But then as you get older, you stop reacting and that's when you get cancer or or you overreact to something you shouldn't like a pathogen. So I think the, um, there's quite an important uh, point I think that you've just made or it's the actual correlation between aging and the disease, the disease itself. So well, we can't stop growing old, we can't stop our chronological age, but we automatically assume as we get older, we're going to get diseases. That's sort of the assumption, I think. So uh, it's, it's sort of what you're saying here is we can actually do something about the disease part. So aging doesn't actually mean or need to need to mean that we get disease. Absolutely. And the most of the things that we die from today are chronic diseases or diseases of aging. And that's a process that doesn't happen overnight. But right now, how healthcare works, you are you know, you're healthy, and then as if overnight something happened and you have a disease, and that's when you usually identify that, that there's a problem. But on this molecular level, this has been happening for decades, and you have been heading there for decades. It's just nobody could give you this warning that you are going to bump into a disease. Um, but at, at the time that you can do something about it. Because right now, when you detect it, it's already at the stage where you're going to go on the therapy for the rest of your life. Very little of it is actually uh, curable. Well, if it's an early warning and you can preempt it, then you have time to do prevention and delay that and prolong uh, the years that you have of health life. So how does your, how, how does your company sort of identify this um the aging process from the glycans we look at aging glycan age as it is now looks at immune aging or how is your adaptive immune system your immune, immune system that changes and influences everything um age throughout time but we can also look at it scientifically from metabolic so currently we would call this inflammation or immune aging but also scientifically look we can look at metabolic aging or metaflammation, uh, but all of it goes back to chronic inflammation. Wow. That's the basis. There are many different, as I understand it, um, different biomarkers as well. What makes the glycans more important, or in, in your opinion, than, than say other biomarkers. I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of, certainly a few years ago, everyone was talking about telomeres. So you had a few theories of what is, you know, what is aging, and we still don't have consensus in the field, and it's probably not going to be one thing. There's, a, you know, aging is a complex system, so it's we will never eventually, you know, we'll never, never, it will never be one thing that determines everything. It will be factors which are impacting multiple things, like with chronic inflammation. We know it's a factor in the majority of the diseases. Uh, you develop and aging itself, uh, but that that will not mean every single disease. So the first theory of how we can measure aging but with telomeres, and this was 20, 25 years ago now, um, and with time this was disproven as a uh, relevant way of measuring aging because telomeres are more relevant to aging of a single cell. So, so like these um, at the at the, at the tips of your DNA, telomeres shorten and then eventually. Um, you know, that this is why cells die, but cells are supposed to die. So, and you have trillions of cells. So if you collect a bunch of cells and then you measure their age, each of them is going to have a completely different age. And then if you model that into a clock, it's not going to be a very stable clock because you can collect one sample, two samples at the same time, run an algorithm and get a 10, 20 years different just based on how you collect the sample. And it's not as relevant to systemic aging. It's more relevant to single cell aging, um, which showed not to have as much importance uh, for health outcomes as, as some other things. 
So telomeres were the first fear of how we can measure aging. And then we realized that you know, it's, it's not that simple and nothing's really simple in biology. Yeah. Um, then 10 years ago, we had the first um, glycan and epigenetic aging clock. So by coincidence, our clock and Steve Horvitz's epigenetic clock were published um, on the 10th of December, 2013, both at the same time. Uh, Steve was a single author and you know he published a full paper at once. We published a preprint together with 30 plus different scientists. So it was a collaborative um, effort. And these are the first, um, uh, let's say, new aging clocks or functional aging clocks, which are now opening up this space of being able to measure aging. So we are one of the oldest clocks but because epigenetics have been developed more and gen the, the genomics field kind of drove all of this development, which now led to epigenetics, which is, you know, how you're turning on genes on and off um, throughout life, everybody um, focused on epigenetics. But what's going to happen, we're, you're going to get, we're going to get to a certain point and then realize we miss half of the picture in our biology, which is um, complexly post-translational modifications, which are glycans, which is something that changes your biology beyond genetics and epigenetics. So I'll try to simplify this, but your DNA codes for a protein. And protein is the workhorse in the body. It, it does most of the work. And you can change how this protein is made for epigenetics. So this is the first level of what leads to the development of a protein. But then as this protein is made, it's made together with glycans. And then the glycans change this protein beyond its genetics and epigenetics. So they're more current, they're more holistic. They take, take more things into account. And when you're looking at it, you're looking at something that you know has all of these different layers, which make you unique as, as an individual. So, so I guess the question would be is, can we change it? Yes, and that was first. So when the clock was published, the biggest question was, okay, now we can measure biological aging, but what's the point of measuring it if we can't do anything to change? It would just be bad news. Um, so from that point, so that was about three, four years later, but the lab mainly focused on intervention studies. So what is the what type of lifestyle changes um, or therapies are going to change? Uh, the clock. And now we have many. We've published over uh, 20 intervention studies on how you can change uh, your glycans and your aging clock. So there's many ways you can change it. And, and I'd love just to, to, to talk about a few, but perhaps before we get there, it would be interesting just to talk about the actual test itself. Um, I've actually recently done the test, I'm very excited about it because I've always been very much into my health, fitness, looking good. I've had so many people say, hey, you don't look your age. Uh, and then more recently I've heard, oh, well, if you don't look it on the outside, maybe you don't look, maybe you, you're, you're not as old on the inside. And because I do dedicate a lot of my life um, to, to, to my fitness and to my health, to what I eat, to lifestyle, to mindset, I became incredibly curious to find out what my biological age, let's just define that's not chronological age, which is my actual age, which is 52, but my actual inter, your internal clock. Am I, am I right in that sort of definition, Nina? Good definition. Right. So, so the test I took was really, really simple. I, and I took at the Health Optimization um, Summit and it was just a, a very, very simple blood test. And then, it, as I understand, it got, gets sent off to your labs where it's tested. Um, and perhaps you could tell me, Nina, what they're testing for or how they then work out from that little bit of blood my biological age and the mar markers and, and areas that I could change because and um, we can go on and talk about the results and what I'd like to do in six months time when I review it is see if I've checked if I've managed to bring my age down. So if you can think of it as a general metric, a metric for your general health, which you know, then you're speeding in life or you're you're going slower. And interestingly, it's not visual very it can be very different to visual which which was surprising to us as well uh, but we had one study that was looking at um, um 
skin and in internal biomarkers. And for example, people who spend a lot of time on the sun looked older, but actually had sometimes some better internal markers. So it, 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 it's not, skin is, 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 a, is a little bit different and especially something like inflammation. It's sometimes vision, visible, but on a very low level, the level of great, we love that good, uh, we call it sterile systemic inflammation, something that's really, um, like, how would you call it, like very, but very low level, you don't really see it. Um, and that's why, you know, you can have people who look perfectly fit and look very healthy, but they have an underlying uh, chronic condition, which is, you know, which is um, um, you know, making their life far more difficult. Um, so I lost your question there, but I think you were, how do, what, what happens in the lab? Okay, yes. So you take these four drops of blood and you take four because we run the analysis multiple times. So we validate that uh, we run it in triplicates. So when we give you a number, that number has um, an error margin, which is less than a year. So if you test the next time and you see a year change, that's a significant, um, uh, like that's a relevant change because we, we, we make sure that the number we give you is very accurate. Uh, what we actually measure, we pull out your antibodies, your immunoglobulins, and then we cut the glycans around these immunoglobulins, and then we quantify them. And you have about 31 different glycan structure uh, on your antibodies. And certain ones are pro-inflammatory ones, but other ones are anti-inflammatory. So we look at how many of each do you have, and if you, you know, it, it, it's the right balance of them. So you're supposed to have both, but it, it should be the right balance. And then we compare that to a large population set. And our population set is over 200,000 people from different biobanks around the world. Uh, we have very uh, good gender proportions. Actually, we're more female baseline than male. I think it's about 60% female and 40% male. And we have very good, um, uh, we have about 31 different ethnicities in, in there as well. So we then give you this number based on where you should be closest you know, compared to your gender, uh, your ethnicity, and, and your age. So we've always seen gender differences in aging. And what, men would move very linearly. Like they, they just go up in a straight line. They lose the good stuff and accumulate the bad stuff. Women, they seem to have this type of you know, U-curve, where in a way they're better, more favorable to men, uh, pre-menopause. Uh, and also women have less chronic disease, pre-menopause. And then menopause is the main aging event in women. They catch up with men and they, they even go a little bit over men and then move in a straight line, which makes sense because women have more um, chronic disease post-menopause. Um, they do live longer and they do go in the same line later on, but they do have more. Um, the, the, this, this is the main um, health decline in, in women in general. And it's, it's not as easy to manage because every woman is, is different. Uh, but actually, where it starts is um, pregnancy. So the first time we see women have an accelerated aging clock by a natural event is pregnancy, post-pregnancy. So in pregnancy, they get younger. The body, in a way, protects the, 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 the newborn or, or you get healthier. Even some chronic conditions go into remission, like rheumatoid arthritis goes into remission. Interesting. Naturally. And then post the uh, uh, pardon, they um, go to the opposite, opposite direction and they recover sometimes post breastfeeding. So in a way, you optimize everything for the baby and then you, <laughs> you know, you sacrifice yourself for, for the new generation and then you go back to your baseline. <laughs> so it's it's a temporarily Asian. You, you go back to where you were. Most okay. women are where they were. It's not permanently there. But then as the ovaries get to a stage that you don't need them anymore. Uh, nature becomes more cruel. <laughs> and all of the systems uh, suffer. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it can be, so when we noticed this initially, we thought it was just menopause. Uh, but then actually three years ago when we had exposure to it, because in science you just see dots. You know, and you have some information on these dots, but you never meet the people. So you don't really know what's going on. And then as we met some of the people, we, we, we realized, you know, we would have a conversation about menopause because we see this acceleration. And then when we asked the, you know, the person on the other side, are you 
the menopause? And they will say, no, I have a perfectly regular cycle. And we realized then that we see these changes even in perimenopause. And we went back to a uh, study with twins in, in Queens College, so uh, Twins UK Biobank. Mm -hmm. And we asked them, you know, we, we analyzed the samples and got their menopause cycle data. And we saw that this change in the aging clock and our uh, chronic inflammation happens uh, years before you lose your cycle. And actually menopause right now is detected only after it's at the end stage. So a year plus a day that you haven't had a cycle, yes. you're right. in menopause, but you can have all of these symptoms of menopause and all of the health decline up to a decade before then. And a lot of times you're misdiagnosed because the symptoms are so diverse and different woman to woman. And yeah. What can you do about, so I'm, I'm on HRT um, and as I understand it, estrogen has a lot to play with it. Um, I'm actually on estrogen and testosterone and the progesterone, the whole lot. <laughs> and I've got to say it has changed my life and it is fantastic, but that's a conversation for uh, another episode. But yes, what is it in, or how can we help this process? So HRT works really well. We did a nice placebo controlled trial and we would see about nine years aging in menopause. So your bio biological age on average changes by nine years. But wow. it can varies woman to woman. It can be from two to 30. It's very individual. Um, and actually the ones who are the youngest pre-menopause usually have the steepest slope of aging as they go through menopause. Um, but HRT would also reverse it by these seven to nine years. Um, it doesn't work for everyone. It's probably to do with types and dose. And it, it's an area we're actively investigating in. Uh, but estrogen on its own is a big component in aging, not just in women, but in men. Because we did the same type of trial in men with testosterone replacement, and testosterone converts to estrogen. And if you block conversion of testosterone to estrogen, they don't see beneficial. And there was even a study in mice where they gave male mice a non-feminizing estrogen called alpha-17 um, estradiol, and they live 20% longer from this non-feminizing estrogen, just the male mice. So it's also estrogen in men. Men should have, and the, the problem with menopause is that post-menopause, women have less estrogen than men. It floors. Um, and then, you know, of course, your, your whole body suffers and you have estrogen receptors everywhere, from heart to brain to skin. So if you don't replace it, it, it is a huge impact on the body and it's, it's very difficult to navigate. Um, but as you do replace it, there's not a, one size fits all. So a lot of it is based on your symptoms and you're given a uh, you know, different, you know, you're given the standard dose. And then if you respond well, great, you continue. If not, you change the dose, maybe you add another hormone and you follow the symptoms. Um, and of course, everything else in life has an impact. Your exercise, your diet, your lifestyle, all of this is, it, it, it is making an uh, impact. And we do see that as when you're going for menopause, a lot of times women try to um, do everything to mitigate the effects. And a lot of times that means going to the gym a lot. And if they have not done that before, it's a big shock to the body. And exercise is good at the right level, but a lot of times women are taught to train like men. And when women train like men, they lose their cycle because it, it's- Because we're not men. <laughs> stress in the body. And if you put stress in the body, um, you, re you suppress your reproductive system, you suppress your immune system, you suppress your digestive system. Um, so if you're putting chronic stress in yourself for, for exercise, you are artificially inducing menopause. And, and you know, exercise is, and for me, it's, it's, I live and breathe by exercise. It's the first thing that gets put in my diary, um, a session at the gym. I'm a bodybuilder, used to compete, and I still now, and, and, I, and I talk about this to women, how important it is to resistance train. The one thing I've sort of learned after 20 years of, of hitting heavy cardio and sweating sessions where I'm throwing up practically in a bucket, I've stopped that type of training because I realized that was just not doing my body any good. Yeah, I see a lot of men and women still do this type of training. And I, I particularly, um, I, I, I see women and I just think, you know, we're all told this is how to lose weight. This is how you're going to get a better body, which I don't actually believe in anyway. But also, that 
we're not actually told how bad it actually can be for you if you overdo it. Can you measure if someone's over, what the sort of sweet spot is between somebody overdoing it and taking the necessary breaks? You can use glycans for that, or you can use our aging clock. It's a very nice way to measure both positive and negative impacts of exercise. So we did studies where we had just sprint training, for example, and um, after 12 weeks, we see just anti-inflammatory or anti-aging changes um, post-training. And in that study, they also measured acute inflammatory markers and recovery post-exercise is inflammation because you're building new tissue, you're building new muscle, you need inflammation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it shouldn't be chronic. It should be there for the moment of recovery and you're recovered and you're back to a healthy baseline and even go down a little bit on your feet. So it's, it's a basically positive and negative stress. If you shock the system, the system is sleeping and it's kind of in a comfort zone, and you shock it and you get it to recycle, to build something new, to um, kind of clean up and you know kill old cells, build new cells, so forth. And then you have the opposite of that, which is um, loss of homeostasis. Um, and, and that is more going towards uh, chronic stress or, or chronic inflammation. So we did another in bodybuilding. And interestingly, you had, you had two cohorts in this study. You had one which was on a diet and exercise regime before bikini fitness mm-hmm. so what you did in the past. And you had one which was uh, just on exercise. They were just exercising. There is no diet, dietary restriction. And what was interesting, we followed them for a few months. Uh, we looked at gene expression. We looked at the entire immune system, aging, and everything changed for inflammatory and negatively, and negatively in both cohorts. So both of them got older, both of them changed negatively. It is huge stress in the body um, to prepare for bodybuilding. Um, very few athletes can perform at a high level without doing damage. What was interesting is in this cohort that just exercised, they recovered. After the three month period, they were back to their healthy baseline. There was no there was no long term consequence. The ones which were on the diet and exercise at the same time didn't recover in the three months we followed them. Now, we don't know if they recover a year or two later, um, but there was something there that when you put stress on top of stress, so you're depriving your body of nutrients Mm -hmm. and you're forcing it to build new muscle, it just, some damage stays, or maybe you create scar tissue in muscle that stays there. Uh, We don't fully understand what's going on yet, and there's very little science being done on this overtraining and negative consequences of exercise, but there's definitely a lot there to explore where if you go to the extreme, you lose the health benefits. And there are long studies looking at bodybuilding uh, with um, follow-up for outcomes where they see the people who train, swing train up to 90 minutes a, um, a, a week uh, have a reduction of in all cause mortality of 20%. So there is no um, debate about exercising being good for longevity or be- benefiting your long-term health. But what they also saw that people who regularly train three hours of strength training per week um, actually increase their all-cause mortality. But this is a study on the average person. There is no such thing as an average person. So any conclusion from these studies of, you know, do 10,000 steps a, a day or, you know, do 150 minutes per week, they're all generic advice. And they actually never apply to you as an individual. And the only way we can measure what applies to us as an individual is to have objective individual metrics. And you might be perfectly fine training five times a week. We have athletes who train seven times a week, but they compensate with, you know, 12 hours, sleeping 12 hours, or uh, having all kinds of recovery routines that actually offset all of this for them, and they are fully recovered. Um, you might have a very good training range. You might have done this for such a long time that your body is adapted to it, and you can do it without having um, the consequences of it. But majority probably cannot. And it takes time to get to a level where you can train that much and not have consequences of that. And a lot of these consequences are not big. You don't feel them straight away. They're immune system. So we all know that if you overdo exercise, you will get cold, you you will suppress your immune system, you'll be more vulnerable uh, to getting ill. Digestive system, 
that's another one because if you are on chronic stress you're not digest digesting you cannot be running from a line and digesting at the same time and the problem is if you're in that state chronically you do have you know these consequences accumulate as well and then it's endocrine system and a lot, a lot of um, even the bone density can be impacted negatively with, with over exercise so it's a fine balance on an individual level and i think it will be for you to see what it is for you and potentially um changing one of those hours to something which is more relaxing so you can try yoga or aerial yoga whatever whatever it is yeah, try yeah yes. one hour with some try changing strength training because strength training is always building new muscle and depends on the, of course the intensity of it and you know where you're going I, I'm, I have been doing it for years so I sort of now know where my body where when I'm really tired I, I try and stop but it, it also is addictive and there is a mindset thing in, in it. And I think that's one thing. Um, I'm, I'm going to say a lot of women have this addiction of, uh, particularly, I guess, high achieving women, that they just feel like they constantly need to pound out things. Um, one of the things will be exercise. And it's interesting you say combined with diet, because mo most people do actually combine it with diet, and usually eating very little. Now, I also intermittent fast. I don't know whether have the studies shown whether intermittent fasting is beneficial on the glycan age. So we have done a recent study on fasting, so a seven day fast, just water fast, and uh, this was only seven days, and we measured before and after. So we didn't actually measure glycan age, the current version. We measured this metabolic age, which is the new um, clock that we're working on, and that changed positively. And the change that we saw means a reduction in um, hypertension and insulin resistance, future risk of hypertension and insulin resistance. So fasting is has a lot of good sides. Now, this is an intense one-week fast. Well, where data is missing, and there is some publication, and the problem with these big studies where you know, you're looking at a lot of people and following up them long-term, you don't know what cause and effect. You know, so there was one study before about um, uh, birth control, and women on birth control were more ex were more likely to develop skin cancer. And it ends up birth control had nothing to do with skin cancer. It's just for some reason, women on birth control also some dated more. So the cause and effect is yeah. <laughs> hard to distinguish. But there have been a few studies, the big ones, just observational studies, looking at intermittent fasting. And there has been an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and all cause mortality and other things. So potentially there is a limit to it of when it, where it's beneficial and where it's not so beneficial. And there's definitely individual limits to it. One of them is, is, is known and that's the impact on your thyroid. So if you have an underactive thyroid or a slower metabolism, if you are also fasting, that will negatively reflect mm -hmm. on your overall health. So I would say if somebody is intermittent fasting, I would say check your thyroid. If it's good, maybe you're not doing any damage and you have the benefits of it. But if you have an underactive thyroid and you're adding fasting on top, then that's probably not good. Also, if you're intensely exercising and then adding intermittent fasting, maybe those two things don't couple as well. Uh, but I can't tell you that we fully know the answer to that. Uh, but I think there's definitely more and more evidence coming out that this calories in calories out theory was just too simple to be correct um we don't we're not a machine we don't just burn calories we're uh, we it's how would i explain this simply but you need to fuel new muscle you cannot force yourself to build new muscle and then deprive yourself of nutrients um, and that could be for example, my um, result goes up if I don't eat properly. If I train and I eat properly, it stays in a good range. But if I don't eat properly and I train, then it goes the other way. So. Um, that it's, honestly, Nina, that is absolutely fascinating. I can I can already see a few bit, a few areas that I can improve on. I'm sure people that are listening. Um, that are big uh, health and fitness junkies are probably maybe a bit obsessive and, and, and doing their biological age, well, not doing their biological age any good. So what are the things that we can do to help reverse the biological age? Well, the first one, 
we learned very long. So 2016 now, we did like a nursing home study, put on a gentle exercise program and a, uh, and a diet, which was just improvement in diet. Uh, they did go backwards. So this is even in later age, if you implement healthy lifestyle uh, interventions, you can reverse the clock. So let's say that in, in any age, you can do something. Um, and then the second one we looked at was weight loss. And we did that both uh, following twins also longitudinal. So they naturally gain and lose weight. And if they gain weight, they are aging faster. If they're losing weight, they're aging slower. And then we did that in um, like caloric restriction diet as well. Um, and that worked. Uh, we were going to say something. I was just going to say, is there a direct correlation for people that are overweight, um, their, their, their biological clock? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a known correlation. If you, particularly if you have fat, high ab abdominal fat, um, that is um, it, it, it should reflect in a higher biological age. You will always find outliers. So you do every now and then get an outlier who is overweight that has a phenomenal biological age, and that could be that they are maybe healthy fat. Um, so there is also you know you can have skinny fat and you can have um, you can yes. have healthy. Yeah. Fat. So it's not, let's say, it's very hard to put everyone in a, in a certain box, but as a general rule, if you're overweight, um, that that means your clock will be moving faster and you'll be moving faster for many chronic conditions. Are there any other big lifestyle changes? I mean, look, you, you look at people, I guess, in the, the blue zones, the areas where there are the longest livers. Have you done any analysis on, on that and their, their age, their, their biological age? We did do it. It wasn't us. It was another lab in Japan that looked at the super agers, and they had actually really high levels of these anti-inflammatory glycans, so the one that you complained about earlier. Now we don't know why. We don't know what makes those results uh, that high, but they had phenomenally high uh, acid. It's, it's it's one of those. That's a good things. thing to have high. Good thing to have high. On on the antibodies, it's, it's a good thing to have high. Um, and then we're not going to, if you want to get deeper and we talk about cancer and alikins, it's not a good thing to have sialic acid, but this is a different type of um, analysis. So what we also know works is um, gut health interventions. Uh, we did a few studies with um, microbiota transplants. You have colitis patients and they have a healthy donor microbiome. Yes. And eat their whole glycum regime. So interventions which benefit gut health are good. Now, we are doing many studies in this area, um, looking at both like a diverse diet of uh, different locally sourced plants and fermented foods. Uh, these are ongoing studies, so we don't have um, like individual, like we don't have, well, you can, if you follow just optimal diet for microbiome diversity, it's 30 plus different locally sourced plants. And there's a good known theory be behind it, which is, educating your immune system about your environment. Because if you're eating locally sourced plants that have been in local soil, they are informing your immune system about your environment. And if your immune system is informed, it creates less inflammation. It's also, for example, why you treat allergies with local honey. Same thing as food for, for the whole immune system. So any gut intervention should take you to a positive direction. Uh, and then estrogen. Uh, around menopause, post-menopause has a big impact. Um, what else we do? We did exercise. So HIIT training, uh, sprint training had a just positive effect. It was not coupled with a diet, but it all it had an overall positive effect. Um, we did do gym goers, so a thousand people going to the gym. And we saw, um, so I think there were, some would move, aging would even go a little bit up, but some cardio markers. So in glycans, we have one structure which is very predictive of heart attack or stroke in women. We saw that one improve. So sometimes, although exercise may create some chronic inflammation, you might be reducing some risk specific to cardio. And these risks are actually quite predictable. So they're usually. Quite uh, my mind was very low on the cardio risk side of it. Um, so. <laughs> There's always, you know, there's optimal balance and there's sometimes a little bit of trade off. Um, but let me see what else is interesting. So, we have very little, a small study on supplements, one on uh, omega 3, which had positive impact. 
there is one with zinc, it also changed some structure positively. Um, not enough to change the whole aging clock, but enough to change some of the structures positively. So and I'm recently taking NAD, NAD boosters. So there's a brand called Nuchido. We have yeah. an upcoming publication. We did a little trial with them with a placebo control with 25 people, and we saw an effect. Um, it, it was around one year, if I'm not wrong, or 1.2 years. So it, it is an effect. Uh, we're now, we only had a one month intervention in the study, which is very short, because it takes you about at least two to three months to change your glycan age. So yeah. it's interesting that even in that short period of time, we saw something. Now we're doing that with a three month trial with more people, and then we're going to see if we see lighter effects. But Fantastic, because I started that just after I took your test. So it'll be really interesting to see if that has brought down or will bring down my, um, uh, my age. And are there any other supplements? I mean, there are so many you, you hear for longevity, NMN, um, all sorts of different spermidine. There, there is, there's so much you can't, I, I can't keep up, up to date with it all. So we have, uh, so with Nuchido, just to decouple that from NAD, like NAD plus or NMN, it's different. So they use an approach of um, like a whole systems approach in boosting uh, NAD. Well, a lot of times you can buy the raw material like NMN and NAD plus as intravenous. We haven't done any studies on those, uh, so we don't know if they have an effect, but it's a very different, it's, it, it's a different way of boosting NAD. I, I do believe in this whole systems approach. Spermidine, we have one ongoing trial, and we're also looking at um, Viroliptin A, which is a potential longevity supplement. All of these uh, supplements are on the market, but they have generally evidence in animal models, so in mice. So translating something from mice to people is, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a steep, um, uh, we don't know if it's going to work. So a lot of times, um, you know, it's quite experimental if you're going for it. And, you know, you, you don't yet know if it's um, going to be worth the money, but you know, a lot of people are willing to do the experiment. Um, so this is also a way how you can measure these experiments and know if your supplement regime is actually worth uh, doing this. Um, and really in terms of the future, Nina, where do you see um, glycan age going or what would you like to see in say five years time? You've mentioned a few new studies. I, I wrote down metabolic age study that you talked about. The menopause study, these all sound really, really interesting. When will they be available? So this is all the, you know, we have an active research lab which publishes 30 plus papers a year and they look at many things, from reproductive aging to cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, so forth. And then we're, um, we wait for the science to be validated to a certain stage and then we commercialize it. So the future of it is actually preventive health. So longevity is just a name, a fancy name for preventive health. So caring about your health before you encounter a problem and doing interventions before you get the disease. Um, so what we can already do now is distinguish what disease you're heading towards. Are you heading towards cardiovascular disease, diabetes, autoimmunity, or something like that? Um, we don't do it commercially because uh, we are working on it. To make disease claims, we have to go through uh, certain regulatory steps. So in a couple of years' time, we'll be able to do run a test, and from that, not just it will tell you your general health and your, your aging uh, and areas to focus on. Right now, we tell you you, know, you have a lot of anti-inflammatory, pro-inflammatory structures, and this life intervention will impact it, or it's connected to this and that. But later on, we can tell you, hey, you're going to have hypertension in five years, or you're going to have insulin resistance in five years. Um, and we already know that these can be these risk, risk can be reversed. We know that the cardio risk can be reversed with exercise. We know that the insulin resistance diabetes risk can be reversed with weight loss and caloric restriction. So these are all changeable things. It's just that we don't have this information early enough to act on it to do prevention. Um, so we're taking these markers through regulation. And then for, currently, we just published a review paper uh, two months ago showing all the different diseases which are connected to what we measure in the aging clock and we identified 72 different diseases wow and, and, and 
Does that include different types of cancers or are the... So it's, um, no, it's looking at the whole scope of your glycom. So not all of it, uh, some of it is commercially available, some of it is not, but it goes from autoimmunity. So a big chunk of it, about 30% of it is autoimmune associations. Uh, cardiometabolic, um, infectious risk, neurological dementias, cancer, colon cancer, um, mitral cancer, breast cancer, uh, lung cancer, many others. So, and we have a category which is uh, we call not disease or other, which is uh, visceral fat, um, non-alcoholic fatty liver, carrying menopause, uh, smoking damage, and, and things like that. So those things which are not technically a disease, but will you know, deteriorate your health. Um, so from there, we will develop a multi disease panel. So you can do one test um, that's generally looking at aging and chronic inflammation, but also gives you the disease risk in the specific areas. And then you can have tailored interventions for your specific risks and follow that for, throughout life through the way as, as much as you can. And of course, a lot of it depends on you because the first step is lifestyle. You're, you're, you, you don't have you know, there's very little preventive therapies, which are actually therapies that, that work. And I can tell you about the failed studies, if you'd like. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of it will be down to you and, and the way you do it. But I think that's what's so important, isn't it? We, we can actually prevent a lot of heartache and, our, and the quality of our life going downhill by what we do today in our lifestyle. And I think that's something that I certainly wanted to highlight doing this show is that we are the CERO of our own health. Of course, there are always certain things that we, we can't stop. No one can, you can't stop an accident, unfortunately, from happening, but you can do everything in your power to mitigate the potential, what, what, what is coming down the line. And now we have a fantastic way of measuring that because part of it is being able to measure it. Then we can really do something about it and, and really take ownership rather than looking outside, but looking inside at how we can affect and change things. Yeah, absolutely. It's having this information to have an early warning so you can work on something before it becomes a problem. And currently we check our cars more than we check our bodies. You do an annual MOT, it's mandatory. There's no such thing for your body. If you do it, you do it on your own because you cared about paying for a screening test. Um, so hopefully healthcare changes in a way that we give this to everyone. And then when you're doing damage, even if you're really young, you know that you're doing damage. And then you make an informed decision to change or you carry on. And if you do develop a disease, you've been heading there for a decade. So you know it's going on. It's not a surprise when it happened. It was your choice. Well, oh, this is fantastic. And, and if anyone does want an MOT and, and give this test a, um, a try, we've got a, a special discount code as well, which I'm going to put uh, in the link, Sonia 10. That will give you 10% off the, the, the testing kit. And I w really would say it's worth it, certainly in what I've experienced so far. And I'm really excited to do it in another six months' time. Nina, final couple of questions. What would you like to be remembered for? Oh, I don't know if I am to be remembered, but I guess I do. Um, so I, I guess I got to a point that I really love what I do and I love the people I work with. So I hope that, how would you say it? I hope that one day there's a lot of people who I kind of open doors that would not have been there or given information that has changed your life in some way. So they don't necessarily need to remember me, but I hope that the technology will go, or that our work will have an impact on their lives. Well, I'm, I'm sure it will with this, this, this is amazing what, what you're doing, being able to, to just find out how you can change the course of, of, of your life. I mean, you, you're changing, you must be changing people's lives every single day. Um, is there anything um, important that you feel that we haven't touched on? Is there anything I've missed out that the audience should know? I think uh, we covered quite a bit. I think one important thing to remember is that there's never going to be a one size fits all in terms of interventions. And I think the area we realize this the most is that when we did caloric restriction, that kind of works generally across the board. 
But for people who are overweight, if you're underweight, then probably caloric restriction is not, not the need. Um, but then when these people went on certain diets, which was high protein, high carb, with different variations of uh, nutrient proportion, um, half of the people would benefit from a certain diet, half of the people would, would have negative effects of the exactly same diet. Um, so you have to look for what works for you. And that's why whenever you listen to all of this general health advice, you know, fasting, keto, you know, this exercise regime, that drug, this drug, um, never take it as something that, you know, you're just going to apply to yourself and hope for the best. You need to look for these objective ways to, to measure if something's working for us and then ad adjust. And I hope that one day we can also say for sure what's going to work for an individual. Um, but medicine, you know, health, healthcare has a way to go uh, until we get there. Um, but I guess that's the, there's no size fits all, is there? I like that. There's no size fits all. And yeah, it should be a personalized approach. Um, where can people find out more about you and Like an Age? So we have um, quite an active Instagram page uh, where we try to simplify some of the science. Uh, we also have a podcast where we interview glycobiologists. So it's very niche. It's very much our field, uh, but it's a field that hasn't really been explored. And not a lot of people talk about glycans, so we find all the most interesting you know, scientists in the space and we try to get them to simplify what they're doing. Oh, wow. And what's the name of that? We'll, I'll put the link in the uh, in the show notes so people can take a look. Uh, we call it Glycan Hub. It's at the bottom of our page and you have it on Spotify and on Apple. Uh, and, and listen to some of them too. Great. Oh, fantastic. And look, Nina, thank you. And we've, and as I say, we've got a discount code, Sonia10. Uh, there'll be a link uh, in the show notes. Um, um, I am looking forward to finding out my results and I'll be chatting a little bit more about it on the podcast and finding out if the few things that I've done have, have actually lo lowered my biological age. So I'm very excited to find out about that. Nina, it's been a pleasure talking to you and thank you so much. Um, for spending this time with me today. No, you're welcome. Thank you for your time. Thank you for tuning in to the show. Please subscribe and share. That would really help me get these valuable messages out.